through some very difficult times as we speak, Lord God, our uh, very close loved one, Reese, Lord, a long time child of God is, is lying in a bed in Tohoka, Lord, as her days are, are numbered and, and she begins to slip into eternity. Father, we lift her up and we pray for your amazing grace to be extended to her. And I thank you for uh, her family, her children and grandchildren, her brothers. Uh, that are here today, Lord, I just pray, God, that you'll bless and encourage each one of them. Father, we pray that uh, uh, over the next hours or days or however long it is, Lord, that you'd keep her comfortable. Father, we have visitors here this morning. They've come to hear the word of God. They've come to worship you, Lord. They've come for whatever reasons. I pray that you'll help them to feel very comfortable and welcome in the house of God and feel the love of God. And Father, we do praise you and thank you that there is going to be a day, Lord God, that your son Jesus comes and gets his church. And Lord, if we don't live that long, we leave out of here before he comes, there will be a day that we'll stand before him. And Lord, only through his shed blood will we be received into heaven. We praise you, Lord, for that shed blood. Lord, over the next few minutes, Lord, let us be attentive to your word. Let us be open-hearted. Open, have our ears and our minds open to your word. And I pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would move amongst us and teach us. And bless those kids who are being taught in the back. And we'll praise you and thank you for all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Hosea chapter 4. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 4. The Bible tells us in the book of Job that, that we are born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. And what the meaning of that is, is simply this. Most of us have sat around a campfire at one time or another, or perhaps in front of a fireplace, and every spark that comes off that burning wood travels upward through the air. Because it has heat in it, and heat rises, it goes, it's inevitably going to go upward, okay? And well, Job is simply saying, just as sure as those sparks off that wood are going to fly upward, we are going to experience certain trials and troubles in this life is it is is God's word when he says that in the book of Job is is it trying to dishearten us or trying to discourage us no the that, that that's not it at all it's just God's word is doing what it always does it's declaring truth it's declaring truths that we need to know we live in a world that's full of sorrow a world that has a lot of difficulty and trouble to it. There's disease, there's hatred, there's violence, there's, there's, there's uh, uh, war. There's things like this in every direction that we look. And God wants us to just realize that's the way it's going to be. Are there joyful experiences? Absolutely. Man, Sunday morning in God's house, there's a lot of joy to be had. There's a lot of things to smile about. There's good things all along the way, but that does not negate the fact that there's heartache as well in this world. As we've already seen and discussed momentarily this morning, 21 years ago today, all of us at this very hour were, if we have any age on us at all, by the way, we were sitting in front of a television set and we were watching footage by this time of towers that had already fallen to the ground at the World Trade Center. Uh, the, the Pentagon was in flames. Another jet was scattered across the, a field in Pennsylvania. And we were all, with our jaws dropped, really uh, uh, just never seen anything like this on, in our life. We were shaken, as, the, as the, uh, the video said, to our core. And it'll always forever be remembered as 9-11. 9-11, when, when you say that to anybody that is, is over the age of 30, they know exactly what you're talking about. There was nationwide heartache. Now, the average person in a lifetime will have very few of those kind of experiences where there's such widespread shock and pain. Now, our, the generations uh, before has had more than we do, but very few are going to have a great number of those earth-shattering, worldwide, uh, impactful events in their life. But during our lifetime, we are sure to have our own personal heartache, our own personal hardship and trouble. It's going to hit us in a way that just deals in many times just deals with us or, or, or our immediate family. Untimely death of a loved one a battle with cancer or some sort of other uh, uh, health-related issue, financial ruin, 
divorce, somebody you love, the love of your life walks out upon you, a wayward child. The list of possibilities of trials are, are, are endless. There are a myriad of sources of human suffering. And it's those, those, those so troubling experiences that I'm talking about may cause us to question God. Why did you let this happen to me? How could, if you love me, how could, how could you allow this to be the case? And the truth of the matter is, God doesn't have to explain himself to us. Proverbs 25 and verse 2 says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. Part of the majesty of God and who he is is that he doesn't have to answer to anyone. Isaiah 45 and verse 15 says, Thou art a God that hidest thyself. And just simply saying there are things that God just is not going to reveal to you and I. Uh, De Deuteronomy 29 and 29 says the secret things belong to the Lord our God and those things which have been revealed belong to us and our children forever in other words it's saying God chooses to make known certain things and those things we can live by them we can hang on to them and we can count them as promises but the rest of it the things that God withholds from us are going to remain a mystery we always, many times we say, well, well, we won't know until we get to heaven. There might be a lot of things we don't know when we get to heaven. There's certain things that are just the secret things of God, okay? But I think there's a good reason for God not allowing us. There's probably many reasons, an infinitely uh, longer list of reasons than I would have. But, but one of them is, is that we probably just wouldn't understand them anyway. You know, the Bible says in Isaiah 55 and verse 8, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. But as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts than your thoughts and my ways than your ways. God's saying you're not even in the same region with me to understand these things. We don't have the capacity to understand or grasp God's ways. And so he intervenes in our lives in, 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 in ways that we will never understand. They're unsearchable. They're past finding out, as the book of Romans tells us. So, so many of the whys that you and I have, why this, why that, are just going to be left unanswered. And the sooner we realize that, and the sooner we accept that, the sooner we will relieve ourselves of a burden that God really doesn't intend for us to carry. And the burden I'm talking about is that unbearable weight of trying to have all the answers. You can't. You can't have all the answers. And, and, and the struggle and the strife to get all the answers will often lead to defeat. It will frustrate us, if you will. We can become frustrated with God. We can feel like He is hiding something from us. He's betraying us. Or maybe we can even get to the point that we blame Him. And folks, that can be very devastating to our relationship with Him. Is it that it harms God when we think that way? No, it doesn't harm God at all. It harms us spiritually. I have over the years, as many of you have, I've often told people, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And that's true, and it's very, it should be a very comforting thought. I tell these young people this when I get a chance. I text two young men that don't even live here this week, two twins that I, that I know and minister to, and I said, God's got a good plan for you guys. I mean that. It's true, and it should be comforting. But what if that plan doesn't line up with ours? What if that plan involves suffering and hardship and tragedy and disappointment and trial? Is it still a wonderful plan? Sure it is. Romans 8, 28 says, We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. You see, God's plan is not just limited to us. And it's not just limited to our life here on earth. It's limited. Uh, it, it's not limited at all, God's plan. But it involves everybody in his kingdom, and it involves all eternity. That's a lot of involvement. And so we have to understand that. And it's when we know that is true that we are able to cope with the troubles that come our way. If you and I can come to grips with that, those things that God has the 
big plan that he's watching the parade from above the fence and we're just watching it frame by frame through a knot hole in the fence. When we begin to understand that, then we're going to come, when we come to grips with that, we're going to have be much more ready and prepared to cope with the trials that come. We can, but if, if we don't come to grips with that, we can get disillusioned and, and want to give up and we begin to think that God has somehow lost control or, or God has simply lost sight of us in our situation and, or maybe He's uninterested in some way. And none of those things are true. But nonetheless, if we think them in our mind, they cause us harm. And when we have trials that are already causing us harm or, or putting us through difficulties, uh, then, 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 and we uh, put on top of that our search for answers and our frustration, then we become confused and confusion undermines our faith. It's damaging to us. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. When we go through these kinds of crises and, we, and, and our faith struggles, are we at risk of losing our salvation? No, we, we're not, never at risk of that. Our salvation lasts forever, but it does put us in danger of spiritual defeat. A defeated life as a Christian not only harms us, but it harms those that are under our influence, our children. How many parents have fallen out of church because they were defeated and then failed to raise their children in church to learn of the things of God? And so a defeated life not only affects us, but it affects others, but it also hurts the cause of Christ. So what do we need this morning? We need to know and understand what God's Word has to say about trials and troubles. Because if things are somewhat understandable to you and I, then they become more acceptable, more tolerable. When we understand it, the human spirit can withstand a tremendous amount of trial and pain if we have confidence and faith in God's plan. Even the prospect of death can be faced with courage when we know that God is in control. When we have that nailed down in our heart. Over the centuries, countless Christians, uh, the, the thousands of thousands of Christians have stood before, uh, Christian martyrs, have, have stood before their executioners as beacons of, of light, strength, and faith because they had a biblical understanding of what was happening and they had their eyes on eternity and they, they exalted God as they went into eternity because of their faith. On the other hand, not having an understanding of things and not having a hope in God's sovereignty results in fear and dismay in times of difficulty. And that only exacerbates the harm of our situation. You think about this. If you have a tragedy and you have a trial going on in your life and then you add to that fear, anxiety, depression, anger, frustration, a bad situation has just gotten worse, has it not? So if there ever was a generation of American Christians who fall into that trap, it's ours. For, for a couple of different reasons. One, we're a far more biblically illiterate generation than any generation in the past in America, okay? As Christians, not, that might not be you that's biblically illiterate, but I'm talking about Christians as a whole, okay? That's a big problem. The second big problem is, as a whole, and I say as a whole, there are exceptions to the rules, but as a whole, the American Christian has had very little hardship. Our plush, prosperous, peaceful, protected lives do very little to prepare you and I for having the rug pulled out from under us. We live in a society, and as you've heard me say this before, and I sound like a broken record, but it, it warrants being said multiple times. We live in a society that is trying to put a safety net under everybody, under every circumstances, in every uh, eventuality. Here, we don't want you to fall. We don't want anybody 
hitting the ground. We don't want anyone experiencing bumps and bruises in life. And that's the way we're trying to make our world. Well, there's a problem with that. There are going to be bumps and bruises in life. And as time progresses and, 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 and as we approach the day the Lord Jesus comes back, those bumps and bruises are going to get greater and harder. And so what we're doing here in, in, in modern society is we're preparing, or, or not preparing rather, people. We're, we're, we're producing, if you will, people that have no coping skills. Christians that know God that have no coping skills. Because the safety net's there at every turn. They've never had a bump. They've never had a bruise. They've never had a failure. They've never had to reach up to God and say, pull me up and help me. No ability to work through trying times. So God forbid that we ever have a true national crisis. I'm talking about a true one. I'm not talking about a bump in the road. Let me tell you, uh, having to wear a mask, having to stand six foot apart, having to not be able to find your favorite chip on the shelf at the, at the grocery store is not trial, okay? That's not difficulty. There are real trials and difficulties that can come our way. $4 a gallon at the pump is not a true hardship. It's not fun, but it's not a true hardship. If we ever face a world war, if we ever face a catastrophic national disaster, a worldwide famine, an economic collapse of some kind, which, by the way, all of these things lie ahead for some generation, whether it be ours or our kids or their grandkids, God's Word tells us it's coming, okay? But if we ever face that and don't have any ability to cope, it's going to get real ugly. If we don't have a well-grounded knowledge and understanding of God's Word, we're not going to have the skills to cope with those hardships. And it's going to get ugly. Now, I have, uh, I've, I've preached half my sermon, and I haven't even got to our text. So what we're going to do, we're going to be in Hosea chapter 4 and verse 1, and, and I'm really almost done. Here's verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. For the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land, because there is no truth, no mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. Let's just stop right there for a moment. The Lord has a controversy with you, it says. That just simply means that God has a quarrel with them. He has a beef with them. He's got an issue with them, okay? Why? He says, because there's no truth. There's no facts. There's no knowledge of God, he says there in that verse. So not only had they kicked God out of everything, sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Not only have they kicked God out of everything, but now he's been forgotten. And the result of it is this. Notice verse 2. By swearing and lying and killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break out, he says, and blood touches blood. God says this nation is profane, it's deceitful, it's violent. They're robbing one another. They're sexually perverted and debased. And I want you to notice that one little phrase that's in there. He says they break out. You know what that literally means? They're breaking down. They're unraveling. They're falling apart. Can't you see that, folks? all around us we're going to heck in a handbasket one it's just uh, one mess coming and going start to finish from side to side it's just a mess it describes the age that we live in and i want you to watch what happens next notice verse three just the first part of the verse it says therefore shall the land mourn and every one that dwelleth therein shall languish now, I know this is an Old Testament, Old Testament prophecy that pertained to the nation of Israel. He makes that very clear in verse 1, okay? So I'm not trying to say he's talking about America here, okay, or you and I. But it's a principle. It's a pattern that has repeated itself 
with great nations all throughout history. This very pattern that we see in those three verses. And he says there in verse 3, uh, he says to, that they languish. You know what languish means? It means to grow weak and to become feeble. And then he says that they are mourning. We know what mourning is, simply to be in tears or weeping. God's saying, you forgot me. You left me out of the equation. So you're going to unravel, he says that. And you're going to end up very, very weak and in tears. Folks, that's a principle that applies to individuals and applies to to nations. So what about you and I? If our nation or if our world were to have a catastrophic event or if It wasn't a a spontaneous thing that just happened immediately, but something that was just over time uh, uh, materialized before our eyes. But whatever it is, what if things went nuts? What if things got horribly bad? What, what, What about us as Christians? That's the question. That's, that's a question that, that the psalmist asked in Psalms uh, uh, 11, verse 3. He says, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Let's face it, folks. Much of the same pain, much of the same sorrow and suffering and death that mankind experiences, we Christians experience right along with them, right? With everybody else. We're not exempt. The difference is we're a part of God's plan. The difference is we're a part of God's family. We're caught up in a kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The righteous can be carried and held up by the grace of God. But also, as we can trust God to carry us through, it also depends to a great degree how knowledgeable you and I are are in the ways of God as, as far as how we're going to cope in and, and, and a practical everyday sense how we're going to deal with trials is going to be based on what we know to be true about God's word in his kingdom verse 6 I want you to notice he says my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge he says my people so he's talking about his children are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. He's, they're, 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 they're falling apart because they don't have an understanding. They don't have a proper knowledge. They're not prepared mentally, emotionally, or spiritually for what's happening around them. They're destroyed because they just don't know. That doesn't have to be the case for you and I. We can know. We should know if we walk closely with God and we stay close to His Word. So as the world unravels, we don't unravel with them. I want you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, and I'll wind it up. If you have your Bibles, I I want you to see this on the pages. I'd rather you see it on the pages than on the screen, but it'll be on the screen as well. Philippians chapter 4. I want you to notice verse 6. The Apostle Paul says this, he says, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. He says, Be careful for nothing. He's saying, Don't be anxious. Don't worry yourself to death. Don't get all shook up and worked up. Just pray, he's saying. Pray and give it all to God and be thankful. And then notice verse 7. He gives us a wonderful promise. This is what you and I are going to want as things go to heck around us. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a promise, friends. Isn't that what you're going to want? Isn't that what you want when when trials come, whether it be a a, a big trial that everybody faces or a little trial that's just within our household or maybe even an even smaller trial that's not even involving our household but just us. We're going through a crisis, a personal crisis. Whatever the circumstances are, when things are trying, that's what we're going to want. The peace of God, 
the unfathomable, amazing peace of God stabilizing, holding us, keeping our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That word keep in, in, in the Greek was a military term, and it literally meant a guard, a garrison, if you will, of soldiers standing and protecting something from hostile invasion. The Greek was so rich, so much more rich, rich than our language. It, it paints a picture in our mind, watch this, of God. You know, it says the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The picture this of God standing guard over your heart and your mind. I believe if God's standing guard over your heart and mind, nobody's going to get in, right? Uninvited. That's what it's telling us. It's God standing there and saying, no, 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 no. You're not going to lay siege. You're not going to invade the heart and mind of my child. That's a promise you can get excited about, folks. And it's a promise that you and I can hang on to. It's a promise that's ours. But that's not all. He gives us a little homework to do. Something that you and I need to be doing. He starts in verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which you have both learned and received, you're learning and receiving, by the way, right now, this morning. You also did in Sunday school class a, a few minutes ago. Those things which you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, the Apostle Paul says as a preacher, do, and the God of peace shall be with you. We are to be thinking on all things godly, true things, pure and just things, good and honest things, lovely and good things, virtuous things. All the things that we have received from God's Word, all the things that we learn each time we hear preaching or teaching or, or we read our Bibles and study or do a, devo a devotion, all those things together, God says, should captivate your mind. You should hang on to them. You should meditate upon them. You should claim them. You might not remember chapter and verse, but you remember the principle. You remember the truth that you learn. And in that last fact, at the end of verse 9, is the God of peace shall be with you. I'm going to ask you to stand as Brother David and the musicians come. The God, the God of peace shall be with you. I'll ask you a question. Are you prepared? I'm not asking if you're saved, okay? I'm going to assume you're saved. If you're not saved, we need to talk about that in a moment. But if you're a child of God, are you prepared for crisis? Are you prepared for trouble, trial, difficulty, adversity? Are you spiritually equipped? I know you're equipped. God offers it all to you. You have the equipment available. But are you spiritually ready to put that into place in your life and to carry you through those difficult times? Because if you're not, friends, there's still time to prepare. And it's not that hard. It's learning to know and understand God's plan for mankind and for His children. And trusting in that and knowing that He's on the throne and He'll carry out that plan. That's going to carry you and I through trials and difficulties. If you're not prepared right now, friend, now's the time to get it. Now's the time to begin. Now, if you're here this morning and you don't have the God of peace on your side because you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, that's a whole different story. You've got to pick up the mail before you can go run your route, okay? You need Jesus. You need to be saved. If you're here this morning and you realize you need Jesus Christ your Savior, please come forward. I wouldn't embarrass you. I wouldn't make a spectacle of you. I'd pray with you and lead you in a prayer that you could ask Jesus into your heart.
Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. God's spoken to your heart about anything. You come. Oh, to